and welcome to the Computomics podcast. Our guest today grew up on a horticultural farm near Hamburg, Germany. Today, he is Professor and K.J. Frey Chair at the Department of Agronomy, Iowa State University. He serves as Director of the R.F. Baker Center for Plant Breeding and the Distance MS in Plant Breeding Program. He's founder of the Doubled Haploid Facility and Faculty Scholar of the Plant Sciences Institute at ISU. Welcome, Thomas Lüberstedt. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Thomas. We're very happy that you're with us today. Obviously, I could have I could have said so many more things about what you've done, and I'm excited to cover a lot of topics today in our interview. But first off, I did say you grew up on a horticultural farm. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, did you have a favorite crop then? And if so, what was it? Um, I would say viola. So we had uh, multiple crops in our farm. It was a small uh, farm with vegetables and uh, flowers. And uh, viola uh, is something I uh, enjoyed because it was kind of the springtime, beginning of the year, when they got out of the ground and they were sold uh, before Easter. And um, yeah, so we produced the seed ourselves, it was like land races, and uh, they were uh, sown and then transplanted later in the summer for the next season. It's a winter annual species. Mm -hmm. And they are just beautiful, nice smell, and um, good memories. <laughs> that does sound, I feel almost like you took me to the farm now with your description of that plant. Uh, is it the same plant today? Is it still your favorite crop? Um, yeah, today I'm working with maize. And I actually, I started um, when I was still at home uh, on the farm and uh, did, did a practical uh, work that I had to do before or during agriculture uh, studies, uh, I was exposed to sweet corn at that farm, which was something sold by the farmer's wife. And I took some of it and grew it at our farm. So that was my first exposure to, to maize. And I'm now doing research in maize primarily. And I still think it's a very interesting plant. Mm -hmm. So, so quite a long, I guess, passion uh, going back a long time until your your youth, one could say. Um, mm -hmm. On your bio page at the Iowa State University website, you write that your passion is combining plant breeding and molecular genetics, and you just mentioned that you are focusing on maize in your in your research. Can you just give us a quick insight and what are your research goals currently? Yeah, currently my focus is on this doubled haploid technology and um, that area specifically uh, has some history at Iowa State, first of all. So the pioneer, Sherrod Chase, um, he was active at Iowa State in the 1940s and 50s. And I was fortunate actually to meet him when he was close to 100 years old. And he wow. received a special award in 2020. So just before COVID, he was able to come to Iowa State to receive that award he came with his family. So it was very a special moment. But I was actually exposed to it um, very intensely when I was uh, in Hohenheim, where two groups, Professor Geiger and Professor Melchinger, who was also my advisor for the habilitation, uh, had research on double haploids and double haploid technology as um, one of their uh, areas. It, it wasn't my uh, research topic um, when I came to Iowa State, but somehow I got into it, uh, wanted to use it as a tool with uh, the gene bank that we have here in Ames. We do have the MACE gene bank as part of the USDA collection. And uh, they have a program um, trying to make exotic um, materials, tropical materials more useful to uh, the Midwest to temperate climate. And um, they did that by conventional self-pollination, a lengthy procedure. And that's when I thought, oh, maybe here double tablets could play a role to speed up um, the development of these germplasm enhanced maize inbred lines uh, in just a few generations rather than eight or 10 or whatever it takes uh, to get to those lines. And that's how it, it all started. And uh, that was more than 10 years ago. 
and uh, there was some dynamic um, that led to uh, founding this DH facility because I realized uh, it's not that easy to use that tool. So maybe others would be interested to just um, use a service if it's done for them. It's still active um, right now. And <clears throat> of course, then things that are not easy uh, can turn into research questions. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, what happened. So meanwhile, there's uh, a couple of UCA projects and an FFAR project. And I did submit uh, just last week, an NSF project around uh, double tabloids. So one major topic is um, once you have haploid plants in the process, you need to double the genome to get to double tabloids that are instantly homozygous and that's the ultimate goal that you speed up the process of getting homozygous lines which could be varieties or parents of hybrids and um, that is conventionally done by a treatment with a toxin colchicine mm -hmm. um, and we were asking uh, is there um, genetic variation for um, the ability to double the haploid genome. And we called it spontaneous haploid genome doubling. Mm -hmm. And um, so the first PhD student that I involved in this uh, DH research around 2012, I asked him uh, to uh, look at a bunch of haploid genotypes, a panel of haploid genotypes, and to see if he can find some that have um, this spontaneous haploid genome doubling ability. Um, and did he and, succeed in finding and them? He was he and we were very lucky to find a few, in particular one mm -hmm. that we then later used for mapping and genome-wide association studies. And it was not only um, a few genotypes that we found, but in one of them we found a major uh, locus explaining 50% of the variation. Wow. And uh, so we think it could be at least in part. Um, explained by uh, major loci and that uh, makes life a little easier for breeders to incorporate such loci into their uh, germplasm um, and so now we are um, uh, really after such genes and we uh, extended our work not only uh, to work in maize but use the model species Arabidopsis thaliana so we established the the H system there to, to be able to screen uh, a larger number of uh, mutants and the respective genes. And uh, we were again lucky that we did find some when knocked out uh, that they would increase haploid fertility. And so there's um, just the first um, publication uh, will come out. It's a brief communication in, in Nature Plants, uh, should come out very soon. Perfect. Yeah. So, so that's you've already described kind of successful research uh, uh, in identifying new variants, promising variants that you're going to keep working on. Mm -hmm. uh, my, I know that you also received a grant for the development of improved seed corn for um, organic. Uh huh. Yes, and that was that's related to the same uh, topic that um, usually the procedure involves using a chemical, this colchicine. And so our argument was that uh, by using this uh, genetic mechanism, we can use uh, a technology without using this uh, chemical. Um, and it, it seems to, to work. So we uh, compared in uh, one uh, background of a population, the conventional procedure with a chemical treatment, but also after incorporation of this major locus, uh, what the success rate would be for producing double tabloid lines, and uh, it was comparable. So it seems to uh, to be possible to produce the H lines without colchicine at an efficient level. Mm -hmm. And we are now also taking it um, kind of to the next um, level, if you want, to the next um, step and ask, is it even possible? Um, because in, in plant breeding, it's always about uh, being quicker than the competitor, uh, is it even possible to not wait until you have the H lines developed, but can you make crosses between those haploid plants? And uh, because they are at least to some extent uh, fertile, 
-hmm. And uh, again, it, it does look uh, promising. So we, we get um, in the in the best materials there uh, about 50 to 60 percent of the crosses between um, haploid uh, plants produce some seed. And so then we get back to diploid plants with two different genomes. We can go through the DH process or the haploid induction process again. And we can, in that way, create a fairly rapid two-generation uh, population improvement cycle. That sounds, uh, I should say, you make it sound almost too easy. <laughs> I'm sure there are specific challenges to, to this approach. Can you outline those challenges? Yes. Uh, so the initial challenge when, when looking for genotypes that um, for maize uh, lines that have this ability of spontaneous doubling of the haplogenome, genome, our main focus was on the male side because it was shown that uh, if you produce um, from those inbred lines, haploid lines, um, and pollinate them with regular, so pollen from regular diploid plants, in more than 50% of the cases, you get some seed set. So the female side, for some unknown reasons, st has still some level of fertility. Whereas on the male side, usually the, the tassel is just sterile. They're, either there are no anthers or they are like uh, needle-like without any pollen uh, production. And um, that's why we decided uh, we need to focus on the male side. And that's what this first uh, PhD student did. He was uh, specifically looking for haploid lines that were producing pollen or had these uh, thick fertile anthers. Um, and um, now we realize uh, if you want to do these crosses between haploid plants to have an accelerated breeding cycle from fertile haploids to diploids to fertile haploids, etc., uh, then we do need um, also haploid plants that produce enough seed on the female side. Mm -hmm. um, so while our primary attention was on the male haploid male fertility, we uh, start to look now more also into the haploid female fertility and ask, is there genetic variation in um, producing sufficient seed numbers on um, the female side? Because if you only get a few kernels, then you limit um, in such a breeding cycle the genetic variation too much. Uh, even though you can do it technically, uh, you kind of get into an inbreeding um, process that would not um, let you have enough uh, genetic gain over time. So you need to have large enough populations and enough offspring produced in order to be able to, to go through this cycle. Mm -hmm. And so that is <clears throat> leading to also what we are looking into um, this um, mechanism underlying haploid fertility, um, which ultimately we submitted as a NSF proposal. Uh, what we are interested in there is um, when does the doubling actually happen? Um, and we think there's basically two possibilities. One is um, it happens during meiosis, so just when pollen and egg cells are formed. And uh, that was kind of the initial idea that we had, because when you produce from an inbred line, haploid offspring, and so the, you have a haploid line and you can uh, grow it side by side with the inbred line. And these two lines are genetically identical, except that the inbred line has two identical copies of the same genome, whereas the haploid line has only one copy. Mm -hmm. And um, when you compare them phenotypically, the haploid line typically is less um, vigorous, uh, shorter, it looks very similar, it's, but it's just a, a shorter, smaller uh, phenocopy. And that's when we thought, okay, it's, it's probably something that happens late in development, um, because if it would happen very early, then the haploid line should actually be diploid, and it should look like the inbred line. Mm -hmm. um, however, we are learning that uh, this one genotype that we got lucky with at the very beginning in maize, uh, when we uh, use uh, flow cytometry to look at um, 
Do we find doubling in, in other parts of the plants through our plant development? It, it seems that uh, what we conclude so far is that um, the doubling uh, frequency is just um, higher compared to most other genotypes. It seems to be able to happen any time during plant development. And once um, you have cell lines that double their genome, then you only need cell lines that uh, enter uh, the process of becoming um, the, the male and the female organs ultimately uh, to produce uh, female, um, to, to produce fertile plants. Mm. So if you, ultimately it's, it's a question, um, if this mechanism of haploid genome doubling happens at the meiotic and mitotic uh, or mitotic, uh, stage, and um, we believe both is possible. So, combining what we see in maize and Arabidopsis, we think there are uh, both pathways, if you want, uh, used. Um, and in this one maize genotype that is of particular interest with this major locus, we think it's mitotic. Um, and in other cases, it seems to happen very late and in connection with uh, meiosis. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned that you uh, have an NSF proposal out um, that focuses on this, but you're already yes. describing almost uh, results or or at least uh, preliminary results in in what you just said. So what will you be focusing on uh, if you do if that proposal gets greenlit? Yeah, so in that proposal, the idea is to understand um, this difference between perfectly isogenic haploid and diploid genotypes. Mm -hmm. Um, which we will call um, haploid frailty uh, because haploids are less vigorous. It's a little bit like heterosis, um, where you compare the vigor of um, a hybrid uh, with either the better inbred parent or the average of the two parents. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, we are comparing the performance of a haploid to its perfectly uh, homozygous uh, diploid genotype. And we do that for a range of pairs, of haploid diploid pairs. And uh, we are speculating that the difference between haploid and diploid performance um, underlies genetic variation. So there may be some genotypes where maybe there's not a big difference. And then there may be pairs where you have a big difference. And um, we have done some preliminary experiments which supports that. And um, so we have created uh, haploid lines for a panel of inbred lines, which has already been genotyped. So we can ultimately uh, look at various uh, traits and um, will then look for variation for this haploid frailty and um, are interested to see if there are genes showing up that um, affect this difference between haploid and diploid. And I personally, I think um, it, it will come down to genes affecting uh, cell size or cell number uh, differences between haploid and diploid plants. Interesting. We'll have to follow the project to to learn more. Um, I was also wondering, I mean, this is referring to an NSF proposal, but uh, the one you were talking about earlier is uh, part of an, the OREI initiative, I guess, the Organic Agriculture Research and Extension Initiative from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Can you um, give us a little bit of insight what this project is about or what the initiative is about? Um, yeah, so we have currently uh, two um, organic projects, ORI projects, one uh, I am leading. In that case, uh, we want to make technologies that are acceptable to the uh, organic community uh, better available. Uh, one is to use um, natural traits. So instead of uh, GMO, which is banned by the organic community, look at uh, which major genes are known and of interest in maize breeding and uh, develop markers that specifically um, target uh, those genes. We work with um, a sweet corn breeder, Bill Tracy, in um, 
Wisconsin. He has some quality related um, genes, kernel quality related, um, sugary, shrunken, etc. Uh, he also has some interest in uh, particular disease resistance genes like um, sugarcane mosaic virus, mace dwarf mosaic virus resistance genes, and some others. Mm -hmm. And we also work with a uh, field corn uh, breeder here in Ames. He's at USDA, Paul Scott. And he is interested in specialty corn. Um, again, for the organic community, um, field corn grain is mostly used for animal feeding, in particular uh, chicken, uh, poultry uh, feeding. And their particular quality um, characteristics are important. And in some cases, again, there are some major genes uh, of interest that we try to make better accessible for uh, the breeding process. Um, in addition, uh, we um, work on um, this double taproot mechanism that it uh, can be uh, incorporated. So this doubling uh, major QTL we uh, incorporate into both speed and field corn of these two collaborators. Mm -hmm. uh, I should also say Paul Scott, he is working on uh, pollen exclusion. Uh, there's a mechanism um, which is um, there are different genes involved in that, GA1, GA2, et cetera, um, that help to avoid being pollinated by uh, often transgenic field corn. Hmm. So when the dominant allele of GA1, for example, is present in organic uh, corn, but not in transgenic field corn, then the transgenic field corn cannot pollinate uh, that organic corn. And uh, that's, of course, for both organic seed producers, but also uh, sweet and actually popcorn producers, uh, a mechanism that is used to avoid um, GM contamination, if you want. Mm -hmm. And contamination only meant in a sense that uh, the value of products would be reduced if the um, GM content uh, exceeds a certain threshold. Um, mm -hmm. it, could be tested and then per perhaps buyers would not want to buy if you exceed a certain level of. Um, right. and, yeah. and that's for both the organic community and I guess the, the popcorn or, or non-organic communities. Yes, yeah, so the popcorn breeders do use this GA1 already for a long time. And that was also one of the things I mentioned, uh, initial problems. Uh, so when we started with the DH facility, we had interest from popcorn breeders. And we realized it doesn't work on popcorn. And then uh, it was because of this GA1. So we had to develop an inducer that carries the dominant GA1 allele to be able to produce the H lines in popcorns. And so we are working with uh, several of the popcorn breeders, meanwhile, because to my knowledge, it's the only GA1 inducer uh, available. Mm -hmm. um, but the pollen exclusion mechanism um, is. Uh, being used or it's it's um, discussed to be used in, in sweet corn and um, organic corn as well. Um, and these are usually um, smaller production fields, so they may not be side by side, but if they were, then you could get uh, cross contamination from mm -hmm. organic to popcorn, etc. So for that reason, there's some initial discussion whether um, breeders, producers should um, come up with uh, decisions to use GA1, for example, only in popcorn. And there's GA2 available, which is independent of GA1, but has the same functionality and use that exclusively in, let's say, sweet corn. And there's a third one, TCB, that could be used uh, and so on. But at this point, that is, there's no... Um, it's it's very at the very much at the beginning whether that is necessary and but so we are already um, moving ahead and developing an inducer uh, in this organic um, project that carries GA two so that if anybody wants to use GA two at some point in time uh, that we can uh, develop um, GA two based uh, DH lines ultimately. Mm -hmm. Are there any other traits that are maybe of specific interest in organic farming? For example, withstanding wheat pressure or, or other traits? 
uh, <clears throat> we know that um, seed production is is a problem um, that typically how it, how it goes. Um, seed producers get um, inbreds from breeding companies, and there are no or let's say few dedicated organic breeding programs. It's still a, a small market, and uh, the major breeding companies they uh, supply seed producers with inbreds that have not really been um, tested well under organic conditions. Mm -hmm. And so the seed producers that are among our stakeholders of this organic project, uh, they complain that uh, it's a hit and miss. Some inbreds are not doing well under these, as you say, slightly more weedy conditions and uh, to compete um, with um, those um, weeds in production fields, uh, they may not have uh, the success they, they need in, in seed production. And so that's uh, a trait that we um, want to uh, look into and also question um, I mean, the, the main way hybrids are produced is by crossing two inbreds uh, today in, in conventional uh, maize breeding. But uh, one could consider to maybe go a step back and uh, have on the female side um, hybrids, which would be more competitive in, in wheat fields to produce then three-way uh, hybrids. That only the male is, um, as a pollen donor, uh, Maybe a little easier uh, to to handle and have excess uh, pollen, but uh, the the female side uh, would be more vigorous as a hybrid. But also uh, looking into can we select for inbreds that do better under these uh, more competitive conditions is is something um, we do in this other um, organic project that I mentioned, which is more about quantitative traits and introducing this rapid uh, breeding cycling to generation cycling that I mentioned initially. Mm -hmm. And then maybe for a final question, a bit of a change of topic, you were on the organizing committee of the NAPB, the National Association of Plant Breeders this mm -hmm. year in 2022. Um, do you have any key takeaways from the conference from your view? Um, yeah, so I was co-host together with uh, Paul Scott. And um, yeah, so It, it was uh, the first um, in-person NAPB conference since 2019. I was on these uh, committees uh, when it turned into a distance remote conference in 2020 and uh, observed how quickly they had to switch from their in-person plans to a remote presentation mode. And I think they did an excellent uh, job, but um, the audiences in 2020 and 2021 in the surveys, they really wanted to return to an in-person meeting. And uh, there were some uncertainties, but we were kind of decided to, to do it in person. And uh, I feel there was really uh, a good vibe, I would say, at the meeting. So uh, the attendance um, was high at the end. We, we really had to uh, cap attendance because um, we reached uh, 400 and how the numbers were in the past and developing initially, we thought, okay, if we get two, 300, um, that will be good. And that was our planning. But towards the end, we, uh, we just had to say, okay, we can't <laughs> take more. And, uh, but the persons that were there, they were very eager to interact. And there was a lot of uh, positive uh, interactions at poster sessions. And so I was very happy with, uh, with the conference. That's great. I, I bet everyone was happy to get back to, to yeah. meeting people and touring companies and just the stuff that you can't fully do uh, in, in Zoom. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Thomas, I wish we could talk a little more. You were so gracious with your time and with giving us insights into, into your current research, into the double haploid methods that you're employing and uh, what's coming next with the proposals you have out. We will be uh, including this information or at least some of it with links to your site, to your work on our show notes. 
So uh, to our listeners out there, please feel free to drop by computomics.com to check out some more details and cross links to what Thomas talked about today. And uh, to you, Thomas, thank you for being here. We hope uh, to have you with us again at some point in the future. Besides that, uh, good luck and have fun with your research. And to our listeners, um, we hope you'll be back next time for the Computomics podcast. <laughs>